Yes, you can start. Hello, Mingalaba. Lava. Tenoru ini dorang ini kalah dua ma. ECME program ni ku. Tenoru pintika Professor Ikozi ne sini sahaja kita kuat juga ni. Kue kan si bintipan ni. Di ni le tenoru sensor mesti apa no? Jenayi itu, itu nalu di ni kerja tangan kan? Oh, Christmas apa pare? Doa Christmas ni pada biru. Profesor di kau juga entuh lupa macam di ni kau sengar oh, kadia decision pregnancy apa pare? So, uh, I would like to say thanks to the uh, Dr. Kuspa and then also Professor Ikozi. And you have been uh, supporting and then, you know, helping uh, Myanmar and Myanmar Revolution for uh, almost two years now. We have organized a CME program for one and a half year. And then uh, today we have been uh, 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 topics about the cardiac disease and pregnancy. I would like to request the uh, Professor Say Dikozi to introduce and then also uh, uh, say thanks to the uh, Dr. Krisma. Thank you. Yes. Dikos, Professor Dikozi, please. Thank you, Zo. Uh, so it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Karisma. Uh, she's from uh, Netherlands. And she's working uh, with uh, Xavier Fallier. He's uh, an, an anesthesiologist. Everybody knows Xavier because he, he worked a lot in, in Myanmar uh, and for the CME. Uh, uh, so uh, Charisma is a resident in uh, gynecologist and uh, uh, she will speak now. Uh, it's a very important topic about uh, pregnancy and cardiac disease, very important for uh, Myanmar uh, people. And uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, for uh, 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 giving this, this topic. Uh, it's a great pleasure for us and thank you for uh, helping uh, Myanmar people. It's, uh, it's very important to support uh, them. So now, Charisma, you, ca you can share your screen and your start and thank you very much again. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Karishma Ramnakam and um, I will indeed be telling you something about pregnancy and cardiac disease. Uh, it's an honor to speak for you, and um, I am now sharing my screen, so I hope you can all see this. Yes, and, it's okay. Yeah, you is it okay? See. Perfect. Yes. And normally I try to give an interactive lecture, but I understood that now it's not possible because it's more of a webinar. So instead, I will just try to tell you everything I would have discussed with you um, in an interactive setting. Um, I'm indeed a resident in obstetrics and gynecology that I did uh, my PhD in pregnancy and cardiac disease. And that's why uh, I have some knowledge on the topic I would like to share with you. Um, I have to say that a lot of the knowledge that I have is mostly focused maybe on the Western populations, but I think there's some general knowledge in there that's also very useful worldwide, but some of the numbers may be more based on um, the Western situation, um, which is to start with that it seems like cardiac disease um, during pregnancy is not so common. If we look here at the women of childbearing age in Europe, and how many live births there are, we see that only 1% of pregnancies here is complicated by heart disease. However, what's really important is when we look at maternal mortality, so maternal death, we see that even if it's not so frequent during the pregnancy, there's um, maternal uh, mortality is actually caused most often by cardiac disease. It's now the number one cause of maternal death more than uh, traditional obstetric pathologies such as, such as infection or uh, hemorrhage. And uh, this is something that is new that has developed over time in the last decades, which you see on this picture is that those more traditional causes of that like hemorrhage, they're decreasing over time. It still happens, but it's becoming less often because we know better how to treat it. But the uh, cardiac diseases, which you see here in a line in red and cardiomyopathy, it's actually increasing. And why that is, it's because of two different things. 
Um, first is because the pregnant population itself is changing. Uh, women are getting pregnant at a later age, uh, which comes with comorbidities such as hypertension or diabetes. But we also see more problems like obesity in the pregnant population. And that's all tied in to cardiac risk because they're cardiovascular risk factors. And the other cause is, is that we see uh, more women with congenital heart disease that are uh, surviving to a uh, relatively normal age because we can treat the congenital, so the, the, the born heart defects, we can treat them better. So these women that maybe in the 80s or 90s, they would not survive past maybe 20 years or 30 years or 40 years, they are now surviving because we can help them better, both in surgical and medical treatment uh, when they are young. And then these women get older and they want to get pregnant as well. So that's also a reason why we see more cardiac disease in pregnancy. So for this, normally I would do some true or false statements about physiology, but we'll just talk through them. And the first thing is whether or not the systemic vascular resistance increases, uh, whether or not the blood volume increases up to 50%. If there is an increase in blood pressure during pregnancy, and what happens to the number of erythrocytes? So to go past these statements, the first one is actually false. So the systemic vascular resistance in pregnancy, it does not increase, but it actually decreases a lot. And that's already in the first few weeks of pregnancy, when you're at six or seven weeks of pregnancy, there's already a big decrease in the systemic vascular resistance. And that's all to create the uteral placental perfusion so that blood can flow easily from the mother through the um, uh, placenta that's being formed to the embryo that's inside of the uterus. Um, so that's why you actually have a low vascular resistance. And um, to compensate for this, partly the mother's body will increase the uh, number of body water. So blood volume actually increases up to 50% because there's fluid retention. Because of course, if the uh, vascular resistance, it drops, it goes really low, you need to compensate for it. And that's why you have a lot of fluid retention through the kidneys. So there's a six to eight liter increase in body water of the pregnant woman. And that's um, uh, also in part based of an increase in actual plasma volume. So some of the water will be in the uh, interstitial space, but a lot of the body water will also be intravascular. So there can be up to 1.6 liter more blood circulating um, because the plasma volume is more. That does not cause the blood pressure to increase because like I said, the vascular resistance, it decreases. Body water will compensate partly, but not completely. So actually the blood pressure during pregnancy, it also decreases. In the first two trimesters of pregnancy, you will actually see lower blood pressure, especially during halfway to pregnancy, you have the mid-pregnancy drop and women can have, a, have a, um, a relatively low blood pressure. And at the end of the pregnancy in the third trimester, it will return more to the normal values like before they were pregnant. But of course, that is also the um, moment when uh, they are at risk for developing hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. So we have to be sure it does not increase too much the blood pressure. And this also, the number of erythrocytes, it does not decrease, it increases. So you get more erythrocytes, but the increase is relatively low compared to the big increase in plasma volume that we talked about. So that's why you have hemodilution and there's a, a low hemoglobin levels seen during pregnancy. That is normal because it's normal dilution, but especially if they also have like iron deficiency, we often see it can become pathology and they can um, become anemic during pregnancy but it's not because there's less erythrocytes. It does increase, but the increase in body water is way bigger. And in this picture, we can see it summarized um, uh, that you see here the, the stroke volume of the heart, 
You see here the heart rate, which also increases throughout the pregnancy. On the x-axis is the uh, pregnancy weeks. And you see the hemoglobin level, it uh, decreases. And the uh, peripheral vascular resistance, it also decreases a lot. So I think this illustrates why um, pregnancy is such an important uh, period of risk for cardiac disease, because these are very big changes in hemodynamics, and they make even healthy women at risk for developing a cardiac problem, or for perhaps it being the first presentation for a cardiac uh, disease that they have. Um, and we really see that pregnancy is kind of like a stress test for the maternal cardiac system. So uh, women that have cardiac trouble during pregnancy, such as a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, like preeclampsia, they often will have later in their life, when they're maybe 50 years or 60 years, they will have heart problems again and sooner than other women because uh, the pregnancy, it's a stress test for the heart and it reveals that there's something not completely um, okay with the cardiac system. Like it's not completely healthy and the pregnancy will often be the first moment that we notice it. And then later in life, we will notice it again. So we talked also about cardiac output a little, which is the blue line on top here, which we see is increasing a lot, like really up to 30 to 50% even. And cardiac output is one of the most important parameters that we use in cardiology. Um, it's the uh, amount of blood that the heart pumps around the body per minute. And it's really a an, uh, measure for how hard the heart must work. And um, it's based on different things that we already know that are changed during pregnancy. Like I said, the heart rate, it, it goes up already because of hormones, because of um, uh, the, the, the blood volume increase and the stroke volume as well. So we know that cardiac output, it changes a lot during pregnancy. And it's directly related to the effort that the heart needs to make. And also the point that we will see that maybe the heart will decompensate and it will get into problems because the cardiac output is too, too high. And one of the most important things to, um, uh, that we can do You cannot change other things like the heart rate or the stroke volume. But if we, of course, often in obstetrics and gynecology, if um, we uh, have a problem during delivery or the woman is not feeling well or we see the baby is in trouble, we put women into left lateral tilt position because on that side, uh, the fina um, cava compression, like the pregnant uterus and the baby, it's pressing when they're lying on their back it's pressing on the vena cava, and that will um, uh, uh, reduce the cardiac output. And when we put women on their left side, we see that in this last picture, you see that if you put them in the lateral position, then it does not have an effect on cardiac output. So you can imagine if the heart is working really hard, then we need to help it. So that's why left lateral position is often a good first start if someone is not feeling uh, good. Because as you see, when they lie on their back, it has a very uh, detrimental effect on the cardiac output. And then we've talked about pregnancy, but also there's the aspect of labor. And uh, when women go into labor, there's even more increase in cardiac output, up to 50% again, when they start pushing. When we go to the bearing down stage and the women start pushing to get the baby out, so, uh, of course, there's different factors that play there. They are in pain. It's a stressful situation. And also, it's physical, very demanding to do the pushing, especially for women gi giving birth to their first child. So that's also a lot of extra stress on the heart. And um, when the baby is born, two things happen. Of course, there's no uh, compression anymore on the vena cava. So there will be a big return of blood flow to the heart. Um, it will be, uh, the system will be more uh, open as it, as it is because the baby is not pressing on the vena cava anymore. But also the blood that was in the utero placental 
circulation, so in the placenta, when the baby is born, the uterus will contract. And then the placenta will be born as well, and it will be uh, contracting even further, the uterus. But it also causes a lot of the blood that was in the utero placental circulation to become, um, to, to be returned to the mother in a big bolus, like a big autotransfusion. So that's also an extra burden on the heart. Like suddenly there's no compression of the vena cava anymore. So you have a bigger preload. Uh, and there's also extra blood coming from the utero placental trans, uh, circulation. It's returning to the mother circulation. So that's all reasons why um, it's not over after delivery. At least for the heart, it's not over. And it's even more tough, more difficult for the heart to because there's extra. So it takes up to two weeks for most hemodynamic parameters to return to normal values, and even up to six months postpartum to return to a normal cardiac output. So it's definitely not something that's over as soon as the, uh, as the baby is born. And that's also something we see if we look at the timing of when women get heart failure. Because, of course, we talked about the cardiac output. It's a measure for how difficult it is for the heart, how much stress the heart is under. And uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of stress on the heart in this situation. Uh, and especially postpartum, we also see that the incidence of heart failure is highest. So the biggest moment of risk is not actually during the pregnancy. It's also high but it's highest directly postpartum because of the reasons I have mentioned. So um, this is a busy slide, but we've already talked a lot about the hemodynamic changes on the uh, top left corner. And it's more to let you know, there's a lot of other things changing as well in the body that is very important for cardiovascular function. So in the top right here, we see that there's also vascular changes. So because of the pregnancy hormones, the vascular wall itself is fragile. It's uh, becoming thinner because of uh, estrogen, so pregnancy hormones, and uh, progesterone as well, which makes the vessel walls weak and can give women a higher chance of dissection. For example, aortic dissection, but also coronary artery dissection. Also, we talked about the hematological changes. We already spoke about the hemodilution, that they get anemia more often, which can be more dangerous in women that already have a cardiac disease. But on the other hand, there's also a high risk of thrombosis during pregnancy. And that is because of the pregnancy state. Um, it, it's very thrombogenic. So it's easy to get thrombosis during pregnancy and even more during uh, the postpartum period when uh, there is a lot of increase in blood coagulation factors and an inhibition of anticoagulant agents, uh, which is a natural mechanism to make sure that women do not lose too much blood during pregnancy. But of course, it can also be a problem when they get problems like uh, deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. And also here, the postpartum period is, is risky, uh, especially if they've had an operation like a cesarean section. Also, there's metabolic changes that uh, some women will develop uh, gestational diabetes. That's also important, of course, for the heart. Okay, then I had another statement uh, saying maternal congenital heart disease, whether or not it's the most important cardiac cause of maternal mortality. And this statement is actually false. Congenital heart disease is not the most important uh, cause of maternal mortality. Um, I'll tell you something about it in the context of the studies I did uh, for my PhD. We worked on an um, observational prospective a registry called the Registry of Pregnancy and Cardiac Disease, the ROPAC. And uh, what we did is that we uh, observed women that were pregnant with a structural heart disease. So congenital, valvular, or ischemic heart disease, or a cardiomyopathy, aortopathy, or pulmonary arterial hypertension. And we were able to observe nearly 6,000 pregnancies uh, from over 50 countries worldwide 
to see what happens to, with the different heart problems that they have and what happens during the pregnancy. And what we found is that actually most of them have congenital heart disease. It was the biggest group, uh, more than 50% in blue here. Um, and then it was followed by valvular heart disease in 30%. And then we see in smaller parts, cardiomyopathy, aortopathy. But when we look at causes of maternal death, so not the prevalence of these diseases during pregnancy, but the causes of death, we see that actually the acquired heart diseases, they are the most dangerous. So aortic dissection, uh, ischemic heart disease, myocardial infarction, and cardiomyopathy, they are the most lethal types of heart disease to see during pregnancy. Whereas for congenital heart disease, we see that pulmonary arterial hypertension is also dangerous, but the other types of congenital heart disease they are relatively benign. We do not see that many maternal deaths um, for these diseases. And um, this is to, see, to look at congenital heart disease specifically. We see that in the cardiac outcomes, like we said, the maternal mortality is relatively low, uh, but still higher than in the normal population. But as most important complication, we see heart failure in 6.5%. Uh, and we look at obstetric outcomes, they're also relatively normal, except there's a high number of cesarean sections being performed in almost 50%. And if we look at fetal outcomes, it's also not so different from the general population for women with congenital heart disease that are pregnant. Um, there are some preterm deliveries and there are some small for gestational age babies at 15 and at 10%, but that's not very much higher than in normal women without cardiac disease. So for women with congenital heart disease, it's pretty reassuring. However, as we see in this figure, it really does depend of heart disease. We see here in the dark blue, we see maternal mortality and in the light blue heart failure. And you see that from all these types of congenital heart disease, uh, Isermenger syndrome, it's dangerous. It has a lot of complications, but otherwise we see not a lot of maternal death and we see heart failure. It may be over 10% in women with congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries or a fontan circulation, double outlet right ventricle. So in these circumstances, especially when you have a systemic ventricle that is not the left ventricle, so you have the right ventricle or univentricular heart that needs to uh, um, give the body the maternal system blood, then we see some more complications. But on the whole, um, in overall views, congenital heart disease is not the biggest problem during pregnancy. You have to be careful about heart failure, but otherwise it's relatively okay. Um, however, this shows that it's very important to make um, a classification about the risk that pregnancy has for someone. And there's differences, like I said, in the different types of cardiac disease in how much risk there's involved. And to, um, uh, to see which cardiac disease has less risk or more risk, we use the WHO classification. And um, it's a classification that goes from risk class one to two, and then two to three, three and four, and as it goes up the risk class, there's also more risk of uh, maternal mortality or morbidity, which is highest in risk class four, which um, even says that a pregnancy should be contraindicated. We advise them to not become pregnant to women that are in WHO class four, because there's a very high risk of maternal death or morbidity. morbidity. And if we look at which diseases are in which risk category, um, this is just a small example. Like for example, repaired shunt lesions, like an ASD or a VSD, uh, atrial septal defect or ventricular septal defect, they're in risk class one, um, which is just as risky as a normal pregnancy. So the risk is of course never zero, but it's not so bad. And then when we look at diseases like a tetralogy of fallow that is repaired or the repaired aortic coarctation, uh, ventricular dysfunction, 
um, it increases. So the risk will be a, a bit more. And we advise to follow up these women more strictly. And when we go to things like a Fontan circulation, so you have the univentricular heart or women with a mechanical heart valve, the risk is already a lot higher, like in risk class three and in risk class four. So when pregnancy is even contraindicated, we have women with a pulmonary arterial hypertension that is severe or women with a very dilated aorta, um, like in Marfan syndrome, they already have a dilated aorta of maybe 45 millimeters, then pregnancy is really risky because there's a significant chance that they might even die or have significant morbidity. Um, and this is a good resource to use when you have a woman with um, uh, cardiac disease and pregnancy. Uh, these uh, guidelines, uh, the ESC, European Society of Cardiology, the guidelines, they are open access available. And they give a lot of advice in how to manage the cardiovascular diseases during pregnancy. And they have a big table of the risk, uh, WHO risk classification to see which cardiac disease is in which risk category and what they advise. Like how often should you see her, how to uh, manage the disease. So um, uh, I recommend if you have a woman with cardiac disease during pregnancy to, to check in the, these guidelines, they're open access available. Um, yeah, I think this also illustrates that um, it's important when it's possible, if it's possible at all, that preferably you see a woman before she gets pregnant. So you can really talk with her about the risk of a pregnancy to what it will mean for her heart, what it will mean for the pregnancy itself. Will it have a high chance of being successful? Does it have a high chance of complications? Is there com complications for the baby as well? And if it's possible, we prefer to do that before they become pregnant and by a multidisciplinary team. So preferably there's a team of a cardiologist, an obstetrician and an anesthesiologist that are a bit specialized in these cardiac disease during pregnancy. And they can evaluate for every woman to see preferably before they get pregnant, how safe is it? What are the risks? What, what, what can we tell the woman? but also during the pregnancy to see, okay, how should we handle the pregnancy? What should we do? Uh, how many visits? What is the advice for the delivery? Should, um, uh, how should we handle the pregnancy? And um, this is a complicated slide. It's not really important, but it's mostly to show you there's a lot of factors at play in this risk assessment. So when you have a woman with heart disease, it's not only the type of heart disease that she has, but also does she have comorbidities? Is she obese? Is she smoking? Um, does she have a previous heart failure? Uh, what is her age? How many children does she already have that really make um, are important in how big the risk is? And uh, then uh, with, when you have the pregnancy risk, it's both ways. It's the maternal risk, but it's also the fetal risk. So what is the impact of the pregnancy on mother's heart? but also what is the impact of mother's heart on the pregnancy. And um, preferably we uh, do informed decision-making so the woman knows if she wants to get pregnant, what are the risks and what, what is the expectation. Um, uh, and it's important to educate them about that. So I talked about a multidisciplinary team, at least the three uh, specialists, cardiology, gynecology, and anesthesiologists. But of course, when necessary, more um, experts might be needed, like uh, in, um, um, for example, the neonatologist, if you expect that the baby is also sick. And um, what maybe could be, because I realize this will not be possible in every hospital to, to arrange this, but what maybe could help is to have like digital or telephone consultations with an expert center where they do have a multidisciplinary team. So uh, we can um, uh, discuss the case of the woman and maybe give an advice, uh, even if you do not have the expertise or the team itself in your own uh, uh, healthcare center. So then normally I would uh, do some uh, cases, but we'll just talk uh, through them. Uh, and the first case I had prepared is of a 30 year old woman, uh, which is known with Marfan syndrome but she has not been to the hospital often. The last visit was actually 10 years ago 
and now she returns to you because she is um, uh, pregnant um, and uh, 20 weeks pregnant, uh, no complaints, uh, physical complaints, but um, on your physical exam, no abnormalities and on your echo um, cardiogram, so the cardiac echo, also no abnormalities. What you can see from the ascendant uh, aorta is that it's normal size, 333 millimeters. So what would the plan be for this woman? Well, in the circumstances that you have it, it really is safest to perform an MRI scan here because her Marfan syndrome can give her aortic dilatation. And we know now the vascular wall, it's weak during pregnancy, so it can increase during pregnancy and we have a high risk of dissection. So I would like to know how big her aorta is because we have not seen her a long time. So in our hospital, we made this MRI scan. And as you can see here on the sagittal planes, you have a very big dissection here. You see it here. Uh, there's a lot of dilatation from the uh, aorta. And in this here, this line here, it shows also a tear in the vascular wall, uh, giving her a type B dissection. On this transversal scan, you see it as well. It's very big, very dilated. And here there's the tear in the wall. Uh, so she has a type B um, aortic dissection uh, and the diameter is uh, 52 millimeters. So what would the plan for this be? It's like a ticking time bomb. And what we did is that we admitted this woman into the hospital with strict bed rest, um, gave her thrombosis prophylactis also because of the bed rest. And um, because it's a type B dissection, it's not an uh, operative solution, but we uh, strive to control the blood pressure with beta blockers. So keep the blood pressure low uh, up to the, not, don't go farther than maybe the baby will also uh, have trouble with the low blood pressure if you go too low. So it's a difficult balance but you try to keep the blood pressure under control. So the um, vascular wall, that's very fragile. It already has a tear, it's very dilated. So you use beta blockers to control the pressure against the wall to hopefully it will not burst, it will not rupture. And we followed her up during pregnancy with ultrasounds and scans to see if the dilation was growing, progressing. And uh, in the end, at 30 weeks of gestational age, uh, we perform the cesarean section. And that's a bit premature, of course, for the baby, but it was judged to be uh, the best moment because at the end of pregnancy, as we saw all these blood volume, cardiac output, it will increase more and more. And uh, we did not want to put extra pressure on the aorta. Um, and that's why we handled it this way. And we uh, admitted her to the ICU, the intensive care uh, cardiac unit after delivery. So um, that's to discuss aortopathy as a very important cause, as the top cause of um, a cardiac death during pregnancy. Um, it's mostly dissections that we see in the third trimester or postpartum because of the hemodynamic changes. And um, more than 40 millimeters, it's a dilation, but there's no safe diameter, especially in women with a congenital um, uh, predisposition for aortic dissection, such as Marfan syndrome or Turner syndrome, they um, uh, they they even they can start a pregnancy with a normal aorta, but the pregnancy is definitely a big risky moment for them to get aortic dilatation or aortic dissection, and that's also because of these uh, changes in the vascular walls that we uh, discussed earlier. And then the second case, we have a woman of 32 years old uh, with a valvular aortic uh, stenosis. And it's her first pregnancy now. She's 28 weeks pregnant and she presents to you with pro progressive dyspnea and dizziness. So she has shortness of breath. And when you examine her in the lung field, you hear bilateral crackles. Um, uh, and when you listen to the heart, it has a mid-systolic ejection murmur, which fits with the aortic valve stenosis. Um, but you also find that she has an enlarged liver and there's peripheral edema. And of course, some peripheral edema is normal during pregnancy, but this in this woman, it was a lot. So then what, what could it be? 
Um, well, in this, this case, it uh, seems pretty obvious. It's uh, that she, this woman has developed heart failure, uh, which is the most common uh, complication uh, in pregnant women with heart disease, the most common severe complication, and then also an important cause of maternal cardiac death. And um, uh, we discussed earlier already, yeah, when is the most um, risky period for the development of heart failure? And we said, well, definitely postpartum, because then the cardiac output increases so much again, but also during pregnancy at the end of the second trimester, start or of the first uh, of the third trimester. So around 26, 32 weeks, we um, also see a high incidence of heart failure because then the cardiac output peaks during pregnancy. And then it peaks again after pregnancy. So then you have the second moment that we will see a lot of heart failure. So definitely in women with heart disease have a very high index of suspicion for heart failure. When women are presenting with reduced exercise capacity, they have the shortness of breath, you hear the crackles on the, the lung sounds, and they have a lot of edema or enlarged liver or increased jugular venous pressure, um, be very aware of heart failure. Uh, Anti-pro-BMP blood values, they can be... Uh, increased during pregnancy in a normal pregnancy. So having high anti-proBNP values in the lab work, it does not per se uh, say that they, there's heart failure, uh, but uh, so you cannot use it as a diagnostic test, but if it's completely normal, then you're more reassured that there's no heart failure. But a high anti-proBNP does not ex immediately mean uh, that there's heart failure. And if we look at treatment, it's pretty much the same as in non-pregnant patients. So you use the same types of medication like a beta blockers and um, uh, for the tachycardia. And you, uh, in this case, when it's like acute heart failure, severe heart failure, um, they should not uh, exercise too much. So they uh, can be put on bed rest. But then you also need to uh, give prophylactics for thrombosis. And when it's really severe heart failure, um, uh, perform a cesarean section when the fetus is viable, because it's one of the most important causes of maternal death. We see that it can be really lethal, so don't wait too long if women have heart failure. And then a third case is a 35-year-old woman uh, in her second pregnancy um, uh, with a past history of hypertension, smoking, and preeclampsia in her previous pregnancy. Uh, 55 over 95, and the tachycardia of 110 beats per minute, um, but no other abnormalities. And when we think of a differential diagnosis here, there it's it, it's a pretty wide uh, the, the differential diagnostic. I think probably, the, of course, we're already very thinking about cardiac disease right now, but probably the most uh, Common thing would just be uh, stomach pains. So this uh, dyspepsia or uh, sternal pain because of uh, stomach uh, acid reflux. Um, it could be outside of the heart, could also be pulmonary problems. So always think of pulmonary embolism in um, uh, pregnant women with chest pain because they have a high risk of developing clots. And um, pulmonary embolism could be pneumonia if she also had a fever. But of course, it could also be a cardiac problem. And then it could be uh, ischemic heart disease. If she presents with chest pain and she's feeling clammy, clammy and we have these tachycardia and hypertension. And uh, in terms of workup for that, um, uh, we mostly would do the same diagnostic things as in um, uh, non-pregnant women. So an ECG, so uh, electrocardiogram is very important to see if we have abnormalities that suggest ischemic heart disease. So this woman indeed had ischemic heart disease, um, which is also why I mentioned it's also because it's an important cause of maternal cardiac death, actually one of the most important. 
And uh, when we think of ischemic heart disease, we mostly think of the left picture, like it's mostly men, they're overweight, uh, they're unhealthy. And then we immediately think with chest pain, oh, it might be ischemia. But women can also get ischemic heart disease. And especially during pregnancy, because of all the hemodynamic changes, it's an important period of risk. So uh, don't forget that uh, women also can have a heart attack. Uh, and if the presentation might be more atypical. So maybe not so much chest pain, but a lot of uh, shortness of breath or a feeling of pressure, even in the, the jaw or in the shoulder. Um, so think uh, about it and perform an e e electrocardiogram if possible. Um, because we actually see that the incidence of ischemia during pregnancy is increasing a lot. And it has to do with these changes in lifestyle. So more obesity, more uh, stress, smoking, hypertension, um, unhealthy diet, uh, but also just because women are getting pregnant at a later age and that has uh, associated with co comorbidities. But it's important to realize during pregnancy that it's often a different mechanism than normally outside of pregnancy. Because if we look here at the mechanism of uh, myocardial infarction during pregnancy, we see that um, uh, normally the most common cause is atherosclerosis. So a plaque in the, in the vascular wall, fatty plaque. And uh, in pregnancy, that is not the case. It still happens, but more often we see these dissection. So uh, dissection of the coronary arteries, which uh, is again, like with the aortic dissection because of um, uh, fragile vascular walls uh, that are easy to dilate, easy to tear because of the pregnancy hormones. And this is important because normally um, what we prefer to do is um, when there's like a clot or a big plaque, to perform percutaneous coronary intervention. Um, but if you have a coronary dissection, percutaneous intervention is not helpful because there's already a tear in the vascular walls and you're going to manipulate with your endovascular uh, system. And that may even be harmful. So be aware that when you have ischemia during pregnancy in a, in a woman, that it's not always atherosclerosis, and it could also be a dissection of the coronary arteries. And then the last case I have is of a 20-year-old woman um, who has a bicuspid aortic valve, which is a congenital heart effect. And we see often a lot of aortic stenosis in that. And this woman indeed has such a severe aortic stenosis that she needs a valve replacement. Or it could also have been maybe, for example, she had rheumatic uh, heart disease, uh, rheumatic uh, valve disease, uh, which causes her valve to need replacement. And I would normally have posed a question to you would, would you recommend a bioprosthetic heart valve or a mechanical heart valve? And um, uh, normally, um, uh, um, the, the um, preferred option for young patients is the mechanical heart valve because it has a longer life duration. It has uh, the bioprosthetic valve, it will need to be replaced. And if she's only 20, she will need a lot of replacements in her life and it will get more difficult each procedure because of the scarring. So preferably in young people, normally we do mechanical heart uh, valve replacement, but she is a woman. And um, uh, okay, we gave her a mechanical heart valve because it's more durable, but now she's 20 years old and she comes to you and she's seven weeks pregnant and she uses a senocomerol or something like warfarin, a vitamin K antagonist, because um, uh, she needs that for a mechanical heart valve. But what to do now with the pregnancy? And that's the important point I want to make. Um, uh, mechanical heart valves are dangerous during pregnancy. So only um, in 85% women with a mechanical heart valve, they have an uncomplicated live birth after their pregnancy because we see a lot of complications in terms of uh, maternal death, in hospitalization, we see thrombosis, but we also see a lot of bleeding because the anticoagulation, and uh, we see also a lot of fetal complications of miscarriage and fetal death. 
And um, that's because of the medication they use for the mechanical heart valve, the anticoagulation. It's a difficult combination uh, with pregnancy. And when we, in this picture, it's a bit uh, difficult to, to understand, but all the different colors are different types of anticoagulation uh, schedules that we try during pregnancy. So for example, use vitamin K antagonists throughout the whole pregnancy or change to a low molecular weight heparin or uh, use unfractioned heparin, all these different composition in different trimesters of pregnancy, we see that it does matter. Uh, there's a difference between the type of anticoagulation they use during the pregnancy and the successful birth rate. Um, so, so uh, what we advise now, what we do uh, that seems to be safest is to, um, when they normally, they will be on warfarin, for example, or osenacumarol, uh, vitamin K antagonist before they get pregnant. The moment that they know they are pregnant, like maybe at six weeks of gestation, switch them to a frexiparine or nadroparine, like a low molecular weight heparin. Uh, do the injections every day because the vitamin K antagonist, they're, they're, they are associated with miscarriage. They are associated with embryopathy, so also congenital defects in the, in the embryo. So in the first trimester, we switch them to low molecular weight heparin. And then when they're out of the first trimester, so past the first 12 weeks, they uh, don't no longer have the risk of congenital malformation and no, uh, the miscarriage risk is lower. Then we switch back to the vitamin K antagonist because the vitamin K antagonist is safest for preventing thrombosis. Uh, the low molecular weight heparin, it's, it's less effective. So that's why after the first trimester, we switch back to the vitamin K antagonist like warfarin. And we use that throughout the pregnancy. But when they get to 36 weeks of gestation and the chance that she will give birth soon is becoming more uh, big, then we switch again to low molecular weight heparin because it's not safe to give birth while using vitamin K antagonist because you cannot change the anticoagulation effects of it. You, there's no pill or anything to stop it. So when they give birth while using warfarin, it's dangerous because there's a big chance of a lot of bleeding. Um, so at 36 weeks of gestation, uh, we switch again to frexiparine, so uh, low molecular weight heparin, and we use that until after the delivery. And after delivery, they can uh, go back to their own medication. But um, during the labor itself, of course, it must be stopped as well. Um, and that's to, to come back to the case that we discussed. That's why for young women that still want to become pregnant, uh, if they have a, need a valve replacement, then maybe it's preferable to give them a biopathesis. Uh, or at least, and because as we see here, uh, I'm sorry, this is in Dutch, but we have the mechanical valves, which have a high rate of complications. But then when you have the bioprosthetic valves, they're just as safe as not having a valve prosthesis. So there may be a little more, more complications, but it's way better than a mechanical um, prosthesis during the pregnancy. So what I advise is if you have a young woman that definitely wants to become pregnant, and she needs a valve replacement, preferably use a bioprosthetic valve. And when she is done with the pregnancies, when she has um, her family is complete, then you can put in a mechanical heart valve because it will be, it need be more durable. So then we're nearly uh, at the end of the at, at lecture. Um, uh, we're done with the cases, but I still have some information about cardiac drugs for you because um, we're dealing with two problems. It's not only an, a cardiac problem, it's also an obstetric case uh, when, woman, uh, when a woman is pregnant. Um, so it's important to see what is safe during pregnancy, uh, what has potential um, harmful effects on the fetus, but what also has unexpected obstetric implications or cardiac implications. So in terms of antihypertensive agents, uh, most safe is methyl dopa or beta blockers during pregnancy. And you can also safely use uh, digoxin or low molecular weight heparin. 
uh, low doses of acetyl salicylic acid, which we um, use to uh, prevent preeclampsia in women that have a high risk of developing preeclampsia. And uh, you can use furosemida as a diuretic outside of the first trimester. What is unsafe are ACE blockers or angiotensin II uh, antagonists. They are um, causing congenital uh, defects in the fetus. Uh, spironolactone as well, it's un unsafe, and statins. So we recommend stopping these medications and switching to an alternative uh, when a woman wants to become pregnant. And also we talked about acenacumarol or warfarin. Um, uh, it's relatively unsafe in the first trimester and during labor. Uh, but we realized that there are often limited about the effects of medication during pregnancy because often it's not well studied. And then when we look at obstetric drugs, drugs that are used often by the gynecologist, um, be also aware of the cardiovascular side effects. So, um, for example, misoprostol or oxytocin, which we do induce um, use for induction of labor or control of postpartum bleeding, they can cause uh, arrhythmias. And I think most important is that there can be hypotension. Uh, so the blood pressure will drop. Uh, also, for example, when we use antihypertensive drugs to treat a woman that has preeclampsia, we will give them an, an ifidipine, perhaps, or methyl dopa, or beta blockers. Beware, uh, you should use it. If it's necessary, you should use it. But be aware that it can cause hypotension. And, of course, different types of medication cause more severe hypertension, more um, sudden hypotension than other types. Methyl dopa, for example, it's really stable. It works a bit more slowly. But if you give someone labitalol intravenous infusion, then you can see a big drop in the blood pressure. And for a woman with a cardiac disease, a woman that has heart failure or a woman that has a congenital heart disease, you do not want the blood pressure to drop so suddenly because it will be dangerous for their heart. And then um, the last part is about the delivery mode. And I had the last statement was that pregnant women with heart disease should deliver by cesarean section. Um, and that's actually false. Uh, I've talked a bit about cesarean section in the cases that we discussed, but these were pretty extreme cases. Um, uh, when we uh, compare cesarean delivery versus a normal delivery, the cesarean section maybe has less pain or stress in the short term as advantages. And an advantage can be that it's planable. So if, if you have a very high risk a woman and maybe also the baby is also sick because the baby also has a congenital heart effect and you need a neonatologist to be in the, in the hospital to, to um, uh, take care of the baby, then maybe a cesarean section is more planable in, for the timing of the delivery. However, there are a lot of disadvantages for the cesarean section. There's always the operative risk of bleeding or infection or um, um, causing trauma to maybe the bladder or the, the intestine. And there's also the risk of the anesthesia. You need to put the spinal anesthesia or full uh, anesthesia, and that can be also harmful for the mother's cardiac uh, status. And very importantly, it's a risk for next pregnancy of the woman. So you have a risk of abnormal placentation like placenta previa or um, uh, placenta increta, acreta, the, bar, the placenta will grow into the scar of the cesarean section uh, or uterine rupture. When you perform a cesarean section and our next birth is a vaginal birth, we always have the risk that the scar, it will break. And it can be very lethal for both woman and the child. Uh, these women have a longer recovery and uh, also for the baby, it's, uh, it can be less safe, if, especially if it's a premature cesarean section or before the 38 um, weeks of pregnancy, we see more often wet lung problems in uh, uh, the baby. And the vaginal delivery, it has the advantages that it does not have these risks. So there's less blood loss, less thrombosis, less infection, no anesthesia associated risk. And um, uh, especially in a woman with heart disease, thrombosis or infection or blood loss, it can be really dangerous. Of course, the disadvantage is it can be a longer duration and can be stressful.
So that leads to the conclusion that actually the cardiac indications to perform a planned cesarean section, of course, an emergency cesarean section, it's all maybe some way, uh, always necessary because of obstetric uh, indication. So the fetal uh, the heart rate is not reassuring or other complications, but cardiac indications to perform a planned cesarean sections are very few, very limited it's almost always preferable to perform a vaginal delivery because these risks that we uh, mentioned in the previous slide, they are dangerous for women with cardiac disease. Um, so when you would prefer a cesarean section is in these cases. When a woman has an aortic dilatation uh, of the ascendant aorta of more than 45 millimeters, then that's a reason to perform a cesarean section. Or, as we discussed, the vitamin K antagonist, the oral anticoagulation like warfarin, when they go into labor while using this, it's also safer to perform a cesarean section because you can control the setting better and you don't want her to have a lot of blood loss. And um, uh, when women have severe aortic stenosis, uh, it can also be a reason for um, uh, uh, cesarean section instead of vaginal delivery and uh, when they have severe heart failure. So that's actually all the reasons for cesarean section on a cardiac indication. Of course, you should discuss it case by case, but these are the most important things that are really uh, important to avoid the vaginal delivery. And for most other uh, defects, you can have a vaginal delivery. It's safer. And uh, <laughs> when there's like a medium risk and you're afraid, okay, maybe um, the heart failure is uh, not so bad, but it's still there. There's things you can do to still have a vaginal delivery, but avoid the stress on the heart. Like if it's available in your setting, uh, use epidural analgesia. So give epidural, so at least the pain and the stress of labor, it's um, uh, not contributing to the stress on the heart. Or uh, maybe if you say, okay, she has a descendant aorta uh, that's dilated, it's not so bad, but it's still, I'm a bit nervous about it. Um, a vaginal delivery without pushing. So uh, with li limiting pushing by using a Ventus or a forcep delivery uh, could also be possible. Um, and I stress this point because, of course, the number of cesareans, it's different for each country. And here we see the background rate of cesarean sections in different countries. Um, uh, but when we look at cesarean sections in cardiac patients, almost every country is performing a lot of cesarean sections. And as I've just explained, it's not per se always the best uh, mode of delivery for cardiac uh, women with cardiac disease. But we often see that doctors get kind of nervous when there's a woman with cardiac disease and they think it's safer to perform a cesarean section. And of course, on a case-to-case -case basis, you know best, you know that you can make the judgment, can she be in labor, can she push? But um, uh, it's not always the safest option and it's, sometimes it's more un unsafe. So these are the take-home messages I had for you. Um, be mindful of cardiac pathology during pregnancy. Even in healthy women, it can be the first moment that a cardiac problem presents itself. And often you treat them the same as non-pregnant women. Um, of course, there's fetal considerations. And when possible, definitely try to avoid the drugs that are not safe for the baby. But always remember that mom must be healthy for the child to be healthy. So do not avoid or postpone necessary treatment due to fetal concerns. Because if mom gets really sick, then the baby will also be, be uh, less able to survive. Now, when it's possible, you want to see them before they get pregnant. But when they, have, they are pregnant, um, it's good to have a risk assessment by a team that specialized it. So the multidisciplinary team of uh, cardiologists, gynecologists, and anesthesiologists. And if that is not available in your, in your setting, then maybe telephone consultations or digital consultations, they can provide an outcome to discuss these cases uh, on the phone with a hospital that does have these uh, multidisciplinary expert teams. Um, remember the periods of high risk for almost all cardiac complications there when the cardiac output is highest. So the first moment when it's peaking, the cardiac output, it's at the end of the second trimester, beginning of third trimester, so around 
26, 30 weeks. And uh, again, postpartum, there's again a big increase in cardiac output. So then postpartum, we also see a lot of complications. So don't lose sight of these women too soon. Don't think they have delivered, it's over, they are safe. Because especially postpartum, we see a lot of problems. which are also listed in these uh, European Society of Cardiology guidelines for the management of pregnancy and cardiac disease, uh, which is available uh, open access. So that is what I wanted to uh, discuss with you. And uh, now I wondered if you have any questions, if every, everything was clear and if there's any additional questions for me. Thank you. Thank you, Karisma for this uh, very important topic, very complete and very clear. <clears throat> so uh, please, is there any uh, question? Bye.